In this lecture, we will talk about the small intestine. We're moving our way through the digestive tract. We've already finished up the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, and stomach. And now we're going to get to the primary organ of digestion and absorption, the small intestine. The small intestine has two main types of motility, peristalsis and segmentation. It also contains a lot of secretions and enzymes. It secretes mucus and salt solutions. It has brush border enzymes. Okay, not technically secreted because they're stuck on the membrane, but very important for that, that last step of the small molecules getting across the small intestine. It secretes hormones, cholecystokinin and secretin. And it also contains a ton of secretions from the pancreas and the liver. Those secretions enter through the duodenum or the early part of the small intestine. And they are absolutely critical for the digestive functions within the small intestine. We will have a whole separate lecture on the pancreas and the liver. What digestion happens in the small intestine? everything. The small intestine is the major site of digestion. Everything is digested in the small intestine. Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, any other large molecules getting broken down into small molecules. What about absorption? Also everything. The small intestine does the majority of absorption for the GI tract. All nutrients, Electrolytes, water, and vitamins are absorbed here in the small intestine. So both digestion and absorption are primarily occurring in the small intestine. To do this, the small intestine has a huge, extensive surface area. This is a mucosal surface that contains folds upon folds upon folds. The largest folds are called plicae circularis. These are the circular ridges of the mucosa and the submucosa that we can actually see just in gross anatomy. And then when we look microscopically, we can see finger-like projections of the mucosa that almost make, make it look fuzzy. That's why we call it a brush border because of the villi. Within the villi are capillaries, lacteals, epithelial and goblet cells forming that major surface area and the space for absorption through the small intestine. And then on each individual cell, there are also tiny projections of the epithelial cell plasma membrane. Those are the microvilli. So again, folds upon folds upon folds of the small intestine, a huge amount of surface area for absorption in the small intestine. So we have three regions of the small intestine, also called the small bowel. The first region is this C-shaped portion, the duodenum. After that, we have the jejunum. After the jejunum, the last part of the small intestine is the ileum. The ileum then moves the contents from the small intestine into the colon, the first part of the colon being the cecum. That valve between the ileum and the cecum is the ileocecal valve. So here at the very end is the ileocecal valve. These look different anatomically but also radiologically, as I'm showing you here in a barium study of the small bowel. Let's look first at the duodenum. The duodenum is about 10 inches. It stretches from the pyloric sphincter and goes retroperitoneal, curving around the head of the pancreas. It's very near the head of the pancreas because the pancreas is secreting all of its pancreatic juices into the duodenum. So if we were to add the pancreas to this image, it would be tucked in right there into that C-shaped portion of the duodenum behind the stomach. 
the duodenum performs both chemical digestion and also secretion. The majority of chemical digestion happens between the duodenum and the jejunum. There are enzymes and bicarbonate from the pancreas entering the duodenum and bile from the liver entering the duodenum. The final step then would be the brush border enzymes lining the duodenum and the jejunum. There are alkaline mucus glands that are also secreting here. The alkaline secretions both from the pancreas and from these Brunner's glands are very important for neutralizing the acid entering in from the stomach. Remember that stomach acid has a low pH, somewhere around 1.5. And we have to neutralize that stomach acid so we don't damage the small intestine. That's also important for the activation of the enzymes that work at a particular pH. The jejunum is about eight feet. Yes, eight feet if we were to remove the mesentery and stretch it out. The boundary of the duodenum and the jejunum is a ligament called the ligament of treats. And that is right where the duodenum becomes the jejunum. It's suspended by the mesentery, as we talked about, these double layers of peritoneum. And the majority of digestion and absorption happens here in the jejunum. A lot of nutrient absorption now through this eight feet of space through the small intestine. Finally, the ileum. The ileum is 12 feet, yes, 12 feet long if we were to remove the mesentery and stretch it out. It's the last segment of the small intestine all the way up to the ileocecal valve. What's happening here in the ileum is a lot of B12 absorption, return of bile salts to the liver through what we call enterohepatic circulation, and also it's full of Peyer's patches or lymphatic tissue, mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue or malt within the submucosa. That is, remember that we can have pathogens entering through the food and the Peyer's patches can help to activate the immune system if there's something within the small intestine that's pathogenic. Within all of these regions of the small intestine, we have motility, peristalsis, the contraction of circular and longitudinal muscles to move the food through that we talked about in previous lectures, and now segmentation. This is a series of ring-like contractions only using the circular muscle that mixes and propels the chyme in the small intestine. The segmentation is about nine to 12 cycles per minute, and so it takes about three to five hours to move food completely through the small intestine. Then digestion. So the small intestine is the primary location of digestion in the GI tract. Everything is digested here. Carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. If you want a review of that digestion, go back to our introductory lecture where I show that breakdown and absorption. Remember overall that we have the chyme which has mixed with the gastric juices in the stomach and it's going to enter from the stomach through the pyloric sphincter. And then we have enzymes within the small intestine, mainly the enzymes that are coming in through the pancreas. Those enzymes the bicarbonate produced in the pancreas and the bile salts through the liver are going to help to digest and break down that chyme entering in from the stomach. Then we have the brush border enzymes which are the final step of digestion. Secretions within the small intestine that help this digestion to occur are an aqueous salt solution and mucus, the enterogastrones, cholecystokinin and secretin, which help to regulate hormonally local signals, and then the brush border enzymes bound to the microvilli. I've said this like four times now, but just in case you didn't hear it, 
All the other enzymes come from the pancreas and they are activated within the small intestine. I'll show you those in the pancreas lecture. Overall, we've listed a lot of enzymes so far. So I want you to take a look at this figure from your textbook. This is box 41.1, and it shows all the different digestive enzymes, starting with the oral cavity and moving all the way to the small intestine. Remember, the salivary glands are secreting amylase and a little bit of lingual lipase. The stomach is secreting pepsin and a little bit of gastric lipase, but the majority of the enzymes are right here in the small intestine. The small intestine itself has the brush border enzymes listed here. And then all the other enzymes come from the pancreas entering into the duodenum and those are listed here. You'll notice that all the enzymes have an A's at the end. A sucrase breaks down sucrose. Lactase breaks down lactose. Peptidases break down peptides. So that can help you work through the names of these different enzymes. All right, the small intestine also secretes hormones that regulate gastric motility and emptying. Why does the small intestine want to regulate the stomach? Think about it. This is the small intestine talking to the stomach so that the small intestine doesn't become overwhelmed with food stuffs or chyme from the stomach. So cholecystokinin and secretin will slow down the stomach and say, hey guys, I've got enough to work on. Give me some time before you give me more chyme. So CCK and secretin will inhibit stomach motility and emptying to give the small intestine more time to process. It, they will especially be secreted when there are high fatty meals, when there's a lot of stomach acid coming into the small intestine. That's to allow the small intestine time to process those fatty meals, time to neutralize the stomach acid and absorb nutrients. As a group, we call these the enterogastrones. Entero for intestine, gastric for stomach. These are the intestine-stomach related hormones. Now absorption. The small intestine does a lot of absorption through its epithelial cells. This can happen both through secondary active transport, through transporters using sodium and proton gradients transporting small molecules across the epithelium. This includes electrolytes, monosaccharides, amino acids, and also water. And then passive diffusion, fatty acids and triglycerides after the micelles deliver them to the surface are also passively able to diffuse. And then vitamins. Remember that all of this takes time to process. So what happens when you have an excess of motility or some pathogen that has disrupted the motility in the small intestine? Well, if things are moving too quickly through the small intestine, you can have less absorption because you didn't have the time for them to be diffused or transported. This can lead to lack of nutrient absorption, lack of vitamin absorption, and way too much contents in the small intestine moving through. So absorption is incredibly important within the small intestine to get these necessary nutrients, electrolytes, water, and vitamins into the body. All right, that's it for this one. Let me know if you have any questions.